Well, okay, <laughs> we'll get started now. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, and just um, first things first to say if everyone could keep their microphones muted apart from our panelists, um, unless you want to ask a question, but also we'd encourage you to ask questions in the chat. So if you go to the chat box, um, you can type your questions in there and we'll take questions as we go. Um, and also panelists, if you'd like to answer questions in the chat um, while you're not speaking or that's totally fine as well. Um, this webinar has been is possible because of the um, Future Farm Resilience Project, which has been coordinated by the Land Workers Alliance. Um, the project is uh, to advise and support farmers um, who are transitioning away from having their basic payment and help them build resilience in their businesses. So uh, it's about really focusing on um, trying agroecological methods. And there's lots of resources in the form of uh, webinars like this one toolkits, um, mentoring, and also networking and events. Um, so if you're interested in finding out more about the program, uh, you can go to the Landworks Alliance website and check it out and see what's on, because this actually is the fourth webinar in the webinar series, and there's quite a few up and coming. So there may well be things that you might be keen on. And this is the third webinar that um, we have done uh, in conjunction with the PFLA. Um, and all around direct selling and based on a, a toolkit that I brought together for the PFLA um, about direct selling. Uh, so the toolkit was based a lot on the knowledge of the PFLA network. Um, and uh, today we're gonna to be focusing in on dairy. So uh, we'll be talking about um, bottling milk to sell, uh, different processed products, um, also, uh, how you uh, manage sales and distribution, packaging, processing, and labeling. Um, and we're joined by four great panelists. So thanks all for joining. We've got um, David uh, from the Ethical Dairy and hopefully uh, Wilma will be joining us at some point as well. Um, we've got Johnny uh, from Fen Farm Dairy. Uh, we've got Rebecca from Old Hall Farm um, and we've got Angus from Dalton's Dairy. So thank you so much everyone. Um, for being part of this. Uh, so I think I'll hand it over to you guys to do a, a quick intro um, about your farm and your business. So uh, if we go with David first, that would be great. Thanks. Oh, you're on mute. A good, off to a good start. Um, <laughs> we, we're based in southwest Scotland. We're quite remote, 100 miles from anywhere. Um, it's an all grass farm. Um, 340 hectares, um, 200 of which are improved grassland. Uh, the 100 hectares of uh, rough grazing and scrub, and 40 hectares of woodland and uh, mixed broadleaf woodland. Uh, we have 125 dairy cows um, and all the young stock through to finishing or to uh, breeding and um, 300 breeding sheep. Um, so we uh, went into uh, uh, diversification 27 years ago with ice cream and tourism. Um, and that's been a, an interesting journey. We've now moving uh, our tourism offering from um, playgrounds and ice cream to more about um, the food experience, which is about uh, doing courses on cheese making and ice cream making. And uh, we're refocusing our attention on cheese manufacture and selling um, direct as much as possible to the customer. Um, we, we do the cow with calf dairy system where we leave the calves on the cows for five months um, before weaning. And uh, that's a whole subject in its own. And um, that has been, uh, I would say, a very powerful uh, part of the, the story behind the product that uh, we sell. And for us, it's um, having a powerful story has been vital because we've so few people living on our doorstep. Um, so that's really um, a very brief summary. Great, thank you. Um, if we had to Johnny now. 
Yeah, hi everyone. Um, <clears throat> I'm Johnny Crickmore from Fen Farm Dairy um, in Suffolk. Um, we have 300 milking cows, a uh, red and white cow called Montbelliard, a French breed. Uh, we farm along the River Waveney, so most of our land is marshes, um, the sort of rubbishy stuff which no one else wanted. Um, and uh, uh, we, we probably farm around 900, 950 acres in total on our farm. Um, we diversified from being a commercial dairy farm uh, in a very small way back in 2011. By We were inspired by the uh, free range hen um, uh, farmers um, who, who had their little garden sheds with eggs, um, fresh eggs and it, with an honesty box system. And we thought, why don't people do that in dairy? Um, so we thought, well, we'll give it a shot and see what happened. And we, we decided to sell raw milk at the time because we just had a feeling that it had some, you know, it was something which other places couldn't get a hold of um, because of the restrictions around selling raw milk. Um, we were able to sell it from our farm gate and that's what made the product more special, um, on, you know, other than the fact it tastes really good. Um, and it, it was an experiment and there wasn't much to lose other than a garden shed. Um, if it all went wrong, we were going to put it in our garden. Um, and it wasn't, it was a success and, um, and, and sales grew eventually um, through people thieving our milk, we, uh, we brought the first uh, milk dispenser machine into the UK. Um, and, and from that, that inspired us to then go on to other things such as cheese making and butter making and yogurt making and, and all of the other things what we do here now. Um, and uh, you know, the next step was cheese making for us. We realized we weren't able to, you know, there was something in this added value stuff and we thought if we could make um, if we could make cheese, we might be able to shift more of our own milk um, as an added value product. And so we 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 went on a cheese journey around the UK, visiting cheesemakers, and and um, and uh, well, long story, but we we decided to make a, a raw milk brie um, called Baron Bygod, and um, it's now got to a point where it's you know quite quite uh, easy to get hold of in in most good delis and farm shops around the UK. So um, um, it's been a, a, a fun fun journey, stressful at times, but uh, it's now 10, 10 years later. And um, yeah, it's uh, we're a very different business to what we were back then. Oh, that's brilliant, thanks. Um, if we go to Rebecca now. Hi everyone, um, I'm Rebecca from Old Tall Farm, um, not that far up the road from Johnny, um, just over the border in Norfolk. We are new entrants to dairy, uh, so we bought our first cow and three heifers five years ago. We started selling raw milk, I think the first cow arrived in the November, we started selling raw milk at farmers markets in the April, uh, with a view always to, towards working towards what we've got now, which is a fully fledged farm shop with butchery, deli, cafe etc. Um, but we actually started selling um, from a little shed, mainly because I had to throw my toys out of the pram. Our builder was running late. Um, he'd been promising our, our building to put our vending machines in since the March. Um, and in the May, I said, right, enough's enough. I need a shed. So we started with a shed and two fridges, um, then eventually moved on to um, rotating uh, vending machines with bottled milk. I've never, never, because we started from such a, a low cow number sort of point of view I've never gone for the dispensing vending machine because when we only had enough um milk to put in two fridges I didn't really want to buy a vending machine because I couldn't justify the money so what we did is we got a, a member of staff who helped us with the bottling and branched out into the farmers markets and so and so forth but uh we're running jersey cows uh fully pasture fed and uh, keeping calves with cows till they're seven to nine months old um as I tell people, it very much depends on the cow and the calf. They're all different. Um, but yeah, we've been, been, get, been going now um, for four years. Absolutely love it. It's still quite low tech. So we're still bottling, bottling by hand. Um, and I did have a very strange email from a customer the other day asking what I meant by bottling by hand, which worried me. Um, obviously we're all raw. Um, we're selling milk, cream, creme fraiche, mascarpone, butter, yogurt, ice cream, cream cheese, fudge and ghee. So absolutely determined to sell everything direct. 
um, we, we're very reactive to what our customers ask for, um, so hence there's such a long list of products, um, which keeps us rather busy. But yeah, I think that's, that's us uh, in a little nutshell. Oh, thanks. That's great. So many products. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely keeps you busy. <laughs> and last but not least, let's hear from Angus. So yeah, I'm, I'm Angus Dalton, not as the name tag suggests as Rosie, um, I'm obviously using her computer, but we are um, Dalton's Dairy, we're a family dairy farm right on the edge of the Peak District, uh, we're milking currently just short of 500 cows, we're on a fully grass system, uh, but once a day milking. Uh, when I say fully grass, whilst we're PFLA members, we're not certified, the only chink in our certification is the fact that we rear the calves pretty much conventionally up until 10 up until weaning really 10 12 weeks of age and then they don't see they don't even see a roof over their heads actually till they come in there and then man about um supplementary feed but um so uh, that's how the cow system works uh spring lock calving son came home uh and pretty well uh taking on managing of the herd uh, daughter came home from uni and wanted to do something di different so we looked at diversification ice cream was the relatively easy answer on a small scale um, just to get us a t you know foot in the door um, a bit like David really said just there we are um, we're not near anywhere nearest towns eight mile, miles away um, you know Ashbourne you talk to we're halfway between the two but it is and we're not near, you know, we're not even in a village really, um, as such. 40, 40 people live in the village here or whatever. Yeah. Um, so we just wanted to find out if something was going to work. And um, to start off with, for three years, we actually used someone else's ice cream plant, hired it on a day, day rate basis. And then, um, yeah, classic tenants thinking, I suppose, really. We didn't invest money. Um, you know, we, we just did things as we went along and tried to build up the brand and build up what we saw as a market. Um, and then along the way, invested in a, in a garden shed, just like Johnny. If it didn't work, well, it was going to end up in the garden, but no, it worked. And yes, our honesty shop uh, last year through lockdown really came into its own. Um, we've since extended our, our range, if you like. We make butter now. <clears throat> And uh, whilst we don't actually make the cheese, um, we do sell cheese that is made with our milk. And yeah, provide an honesty shop experience, an on farm experience um, for the customers. And it is becoming a destination, really. Yeah. But I wouldn't put it in the league, a big farm shop. It really is a small place. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. Um... Yeah, I'm looking forward to asking you more about your honesty shop later on in the conversation. <laughs> um, so I think if we kick off with talking about how you get set up to sell uh, bottled milk um, and also the considerations when you're selling uh, pasteurised or raw milk. David, I don't know, have you sold um, bottled milk from your farm before or is this something that uh, I should go to another panellist for but I'll ask you first? <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> if, if we were going to sell milk, we would go raw milk. But um, in Scotland, the, uh, uh, the health and safety, the um, Food Standards Agency consider um, uh, raw milk to be the ne next best thing to um, salmonella or something. Yeah, it's, they have a crazy uh, approach to it. So, uh, yeah, we keep away from that. But we are we do make raw milk cheese and um and that uh, that gives us enough problems so we'll pass it to someone else yeah it's interesting that yeah scottish fsa and english fsa must have quite different rules as well uh, can i come in there then yeah please do so um setting up making ice cream we geared up with a small pasteurizer everything really has to be pasteurized for ice cream However, beginning of lockdown, our customers were asking, the local village, if you like, so all 40 of them, <laughs> were asking if we could supply milk. And uh, this we did through our little batch pasteuriser, a bit like Rebecca there, hand bottling. Um, and 
if you actually look into it, um, it's actually very simple to get into once you've got the pasteurization and the refrigeration equipment um, and a registered food premises. Um, we went into it without a vending machine. I don't think a vending machine would work on our site because we're quite remote. Um, and all we do is put pints of milk in the fridge and it works well, it works simple, absolutely no capital invested. So uh, pasteurization without a doubt, I wouldn't even entertain doing raw milk. Um, not because I don't trust our milk or anything, but we're out of control of, you know, an inconclusive reactor, um, even, never mind about a, a full reactor. So uh, I think it's a, a high risk strategy um, to build a business on the back of raw milk. Um, you raw milk guys might think differently, but I'm sure you've got a plan B in place just in case. So, uh, you know, if I was advising, I certainly would steer away from raw milk unless you've got a really robust plan B up your sleeve. That's just my observation on pasteurising and, and the selling of bottled milk, yeah. Pint bottles are found a lot easier to... Um, uh, stay within regulations than litre bottles and certainly easier than plastic. So did you have the pasteuriser as part of your ice cream business already? So you had yeah. that ready to go. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Uh, and then so you had your pasteurised milk in your tank and you were, you were just hand bottling it. So how yeah. what was the process of bottling? How? Yeah. It's yeah, you know, when you're doing 40 or 50 pints a day, it's not over onerous, you know. And, and interestingly, our our sales have stayed at 40 or 50 pints a day. We're not going to get rich on it, but at the same time, it's something that goes into the mix and it's something that people can pick up when they're at the farm. Yeah, you know. Um, so you were hand bottling with sort of like a jug, and then do yeah. people bring the bottles back as well? Yeah, we work out on about 15 or 18 trips per bottle. And the beauty with pint bottles is, of course, you know, at, at, at 20 odd P, you're not, we're not actually selling the bottles to the customer. Um, they're actually just picking up a pint bottle, but it's, um, it's a cultural thing with a pint bottle that people will return it rather than chuck it in the recycling, which is, um, and, and I don't know if you guys with your litre bottles find this, but with litre bottles, I would imagine people are a bit possessive over them because they've actually bought them. <laughs> Um, Am I, wrong? I know I would be. Well, I'll, <laughs> I'll ask. Um, and just in terms of the sort of food safety regulation around selling pasteurized milk, um, are you kind of checking temperatures and uh, what sort of things are you doing day to day? Yeah, they, they, yeah. I mean, pasteurization records have got to be kept, whatever. Um, and then, of course, um, maintaining temperatures on fridges, uh, yeah, and recording on that. Yeah. One thing we don't do, we don't sell our milk to anyone else to sell. All our milk is sold direct off the farm or from us to the customer. Yeah. Okay, which so is important. Right. Does that change your regulations? Yeah, very much so. It changes your risk loading with regards to trading standards and EHL. Right. Um, massively. If you can demonstrate that you it's you selling to the customer as opposed to um you're selling to us, you know, an intermediary. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, I don't know if we want to head over to um, Johnny to chat a bit about getting set up with selling raw milk um, and how, yeah, how you got started and uh, your process for kind of bottling and, um, and also the, yeah, the food safety aspects of selling raw milk. Yeah. So we, we, um, when we went into the raw milk, I obviously did the research and worked out in case I was going to get myself into trouble. Um, I, f I found out that um, I had to pass two tests for coliforms, and TBC. Um, and once I, I had the Food Standards Agency come out twice and, and, and pass my milk, then I was able to sell raw milk. I, I did get my EHO involved. Um, at the time, I had no you know, idea who, who an EHO was other than that they turn up at restaurants and uh, can cause chef's headaches. Um, so, but I, it was a really good move. I, I, I've since had my same EHOs to this day and um, we, we get on really well. Um, and having them out um, uh, uh, was useful to me because they 
told me things which I really didn't understand as a farmer um, about food safety. Um, but, uh, you know, back then, raw milk was very easy to get into, really. But um, it, it's a, a very odd food, as in like uh, the way it's controlled is by, rest by restricting sales rather than uh, working on the actual product being safe and, um, and selling it in more places, which seems to me the wrong way around. But I mean, that's a long discussion. We, 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 um, we, we, as the Raw Milk Producers Association have that um, discussion with the Food Standards Agency quite regularly. Um, so, um, but anyway, so going back to then, we were um, simply just, we bought a pallet of poly bottles and start, uh, made a teeny little adapter on the bottom of our bulk tank and started bottling it out of the bottom of the bulk tank um, to begin with. Um, and, um, and I did all of the bottling at the, the, you know, at the end of the day, once all of the other jobs were done. And, um, and that's how it began. Um, since then, when we've got the vending machine, now we have a pipe which comes direct from the, the first um, line or two lines of cows in the milking parlor. Um, so we choose the cows to, which we're going to use for raw milk sales. So we, we, um, we think the first two lines of cows that come in the parlor are generally the, the, the healthiest of the herd. They're the ones what are the, 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 the fighters, I suppose. Um, and, and also the parlor is at its cleanest and the people are milking at their cleanest and at their, you know, their sort of, um, uh, healthiest or strongest, um, less tired. Um, so uh, that's how it happens. It comes out then straight. It goes through ch um, chillers, uh, heat exchangers, and the milk is cooled instantly. And it goes into um, a 200 litre tank, which is um, then uh, kept in the chiller until the point where we need to um, put it into our vending machine. Um, and then customers now have the choice of bringing their glass bottle back and, and refilling it, or they can have um, either buy a glass bottle from us or have a poly bottle um, as well if, if they've forgotten the glass bottle. Um, so uh, that's that's how it currently works. Yeah, sounds very much like humble beginnings, <laughs> bottling straight out of the bulk tank, which is probably quite a good way to do it. It removes the need for the jug. <laughs> yeah, it does if you could connect a little pipe. But, you know, there's the stuff you learn along the way. You know, the bulk tank is one more area. What could go wrong? You know, there's a, all the things have to be clean, spotless, and uh, bulk tanks. For me, I find them um, usually the culprit who um, who 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 puts the the, the the levels up. So I bypass the bulk tank, and I also prefer taking the milk from the the cows, which I, you know, I think are the the, the healthiest. So. Mm. And do you have um, regular inspections? I think with the raw milk. Um, we're selling raw milk is it sort of six monthly inspections or so yeah it, it was um every three months the a dairy hygiene inspector would come around and take a sample and test it but now it's changed to six monthly visits um and um but under the idea that you as the producer are doing your own testing and um you you've created a kind of a HACCP which is the food safety management system which we all as raw milk producers have now um, and um, that just shows how we go about avoiding, you know, all of the, the areas of where there is a potential problem. How how do we avoid that? Um, so I think we're in a we're in a good place. It's we've come a long way as as uh, as a, as producers in the last five years. Um, so um, yeah, it's it's um, I think we're yeah in good good times, going in the right direction. Great, thanks. Um, um, Rebecca, it'd be great to hear from you how you got started with your liquid milk and bottling and um, yeah, why you decided to go raw. Uh, we um, basically got the idea when we went on holiday to Scotland, having just agreed to buy the old hall site. Um, the main farmstead doesn't have any decent road frontage. Um, it's let on a, an Agri Agricultural Holdings Act tenancy to us. It's very complicated family ownership, as you know, we like to make these things complicated in farming, don't we? Um, so we've been looking for a site for a really long time where we could sell direct, um, although that wouldn't have been milk because we didn't have dairy cows. So basically, we agreed to buy the old hall, went on holiday to Scotland, 
a friend of ours um, has a big dairy running robots and jerseys near bigger um, I fell in love with jersey cows and that was that basically uh, I think my husband had a brief moment where he said no livestock and I went and I'm having cows um, so we have cows uh, now milking 36 having started um, our little honesty shed with three um, I loved raw Jersey milk when we were up in Scotland. I will admit, despite living not that far from Johnny, I hadn't had raw milk until I went to Scotland. Sorry, Johnny. Um, but we do now sell Johnny's cheese and um, uh, David and Wilma's cheese as well. So we can support our other uh, raw milk producers. Um, I prefer the taste of Jersey milk raw. Um, I think raw is, is a better product personally for my health and my children's health. Um, we are lucky in the part of the world that we live in that we have a fairly low Touchwood risk of TB. Um, that said, we did have an inconclusive last year, uh, hence we went and panic bought a pasteurizer. So we do have a, a big pasteurizer now, um, whereas before that we only had a, a 140 litre one for making ice cream. So we have now got the backup plan. Um, I, I do understand the risk factors um, of raw milk, but we are very, very clean um, and we manage those as best we can. So milking 36 cows probably takes us as long to milk 36 as it takes Johnny to milk twice in one day um but you know really doing four at a time little for a breast parlor um and we're, we're testing our milk every week um I don't know anyone milk that I'm not happy with I am a complete control control freak and I don't mind admitting to that um but yeah I couldn't imagine doing it any other way we have very few requests for pasteurized milk um we are now starting slightly to branch out. I've got a few people who want pasteurized milkshakes. So we're stocking Jimmy's farm down in Suffolk um, with pasteurized milkshakes. Um, but yeah, I couldn't imagine doing it any other way. Um, I think with the Jersey milk being higher fat than um, other breeds of cow, uh, possibly slightly, slightly harder to pasteurize it. That might be just my imagination, but we get, if you don't get it absolutely spot on, it can taste a little bit like rice pudding. So we are very careful. So I think with, with Jersey milk, perhaps we have to be slightly more careful how we how we cook it. But I, I couldn't imagine doing it a different way. And in terms of your, you said your hand bottling and someone asked about that. So I mean, that it's it's a pretty kind of low investment approach, right? So, you know, you have a jug and do you, do you have a sort of your certified like food uh, preparation area? Yeah, so we, um, from the beginning, I got my EHO out and I said, this is what I want to do. Um, she never met a cow before, so she met the cows. I looked, showed her the building. Um, I've tried to engage them all the way through. In fairness, they have very boring lives, and if they have to go and see lots of restaurants that are slightly dodgy in the middle of Norwich and come out to a nice farm and meet some animals and talk to someone who actually wants to engage them, then you're always going to get a better response. Um, because we started with so few cows, the biggest issue for us was chilling the milk and wanting you know, to know how to do that um, to its absolute best so we the moat that you know is we spent what two and a half grand I think on a little bulk tank which is an ice cream aging vat I couldn't find anyone to take me seriously to get me a small bulk tank so that's what we went for in the end so we started off actually I had to be really careful not to freeze the milk because we had so little to go in the tank just enough to make it agitate and um, so it's chilled really quickly down to about one degree we don't bottle before it's under four degrees and when we spend a lot of time checking fridge temperatures um, and because we started with so little milk from so few cows I just have never gone up to a bottling plant it's something else to clean um, I can see my jug I can see my bucket and because we manage the milk supply that we put through the shop and online and to farmers markets by cream separating and culturing the cream to make butter so at the weekend we try and have everything bottled by the Friday because on the Saturday it's just us. So we try and cream separate everything, culture the cream and not have to worry about it till the following week. Uh, during the beast from the East and during lockdown, um, we have been known to be able to bottle 300 litres in an hour and a half. You get quite quick. Um, I did, uh, we had a special day on Saturday in that we were completely short staffed. We're doing pick your own pumpkins. So we were rushed off our feet. I milked, went home, had a shower and bottled for two hours. Um, because the shop was completely running out of milk all the time so you know but it, it's maybe a bottling plant would be a good way for us to go I just think with our shop set up um, a milk dispensing vending machine I don't know where I'd put it the customers would probably make a mess 
in the shop if I had it in the shop I don't really want to put it outside the shop because I want people to come in um, but we, we bottle into glass and plastic um, the range of sizes from half litre up to two litre um, we do give um, a, bit, a bit of money back if people bring their glass bottle back um, but we do um, yogurt and cream in glass as well and people seem to be quite happy just to bring that back and actually not always get the money back so great uh, we have had a question saying can you tell me anything about your milking hygiene and chemicals hoping to avoid chlorine and chlorhexidine interested to know what you all think um we we use um both um chlorhexidine we use on the cow's teeth as a foaming as a foamer um we we've tried many things but we found the best success of you know getting really clean teats is to use that um so we do use it um i i don't know if there's a any reason not to but um but it works very well for us the chlorine it does go in part of a, a sort of chemical mix most of our washes um are, are, are uh, alkaline based um and chlorine will be part of that wash. Um, it's, I imagine it's quite, I don't know enough about chemicals, but it must be quite difficult to wash, uh, to circulate your milking parlor, the pipe work without a chemical, um, how you would do that. I don't know if yeah, well, I was say, in, interestingly, sorry, um, interestingly, the, the person that emailed yesterday to say, can you define um, or help me understand how you bottle by hand or with hands. Um, that is one of their biggest issues is um, the use of chemicals. It's something they're concerned about. The only producer I know to do things a little bit differently um, is a lady called Christine Page at Smiling Tree Farm. And she uses um, iodine based wash down procedures. I haven't quite got my head around how that works. Um, but at the minute we're just doing the thing that I know makes the pipeline and the whole process as, as safe as possible for the consumer. Um, we're using an iodine-based teak dip for the cows, um, but there, you know, there's a there's a balance, and I, I I hate using all the chemicals, so I'd love to know an alternative. But there's a balance between um, being being safe and being clean and everything else. Yeah, absolutely. A necessary evil, unfortunately, unless you're actually going to get into sterilising your bottles through heat only and. Um, and, and your pipelines and that, and that's just not going to happen um, realistically. Um, we um, uh, everything's everything's washed and rinsed afterwards, actually. So um, that's the key: is rinsing afterwards. Obviously, you're not leaving places of stuff then. Yeah, that's great. I was going to ask you as well. I know, um, Rebecca, you mentioned the size of your pasteurizer and that you bought a bigger one. I wondered how big your pasteurizer is, Angus, and. Uh, because did you have one or when you started selling liquid milk, is it something that you bought for something that you had? Sorry, was that directed at? At you, sorry, yeah, Angus. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to um, ask you No, we were just in a little 130 litre batch pasteuriser. Um, nice and simple, straightforward, nothing complicated. And a bit like Rebecca said, actually, um, the least kit you've got, the least you've got to worry about washing, the least, you know, hazards you've got there, critical, <laughs> critical control points, you know, it, the simpler it is, the better in that respect for the scale that we're working at. Yeah, that and that is important. You know, if we were doing 500 pints a day, yeah, you, 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 you know, you, you've got to start looking at different different investments. And, um, yeah. Someone's asking here, oh, someone's got a dishwasher here. There, yeah. So, <laughs> for the bottles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's great. Um, actually, and while um, I've got you, Angus, it'd be great also to start um, talking a bit about your ice cream um, and the kind of uh, equipment and infrastructure that you need for actually making it and processing. So what it takes to actually turn milk into ice cream um, and any of the food safety around that. So in a nutshell, ice cream is basically milk, cream and sugar blended together, pasteurised and cooled. Um, and then aged overnight um, and, um, below four degrees. And then uh, the following day, yeah, you freeze it through a, a second piece of kit equipment um, and then uh, harden it off in a, in, in, a, in a deep freeze cold store effectively before sale. Um, 
the size of the room, you know, first thing you need is a, is a room to work in somewhere that's clean and tidy. A food safe room is, is, is the, you know, above all the biggest investment you're going to make really. Um, and you can never have too much space. Uh, you know, um, one thing about ice cream, of course, packaging and labeling critical. So then behind your food production rooms, you need dry storage for ingredients and packaging, um, which, you know, this is very easy to overlook um, with a lot of people I know of that have uh, set up doing ice cream. I don't know, David might smile here, but um, how many people do you know that have stored packaging in a spare bedroom in the house? And you know, it's, yeah, it's happened because they've never got the dry store big enough for the packaging store. Um, minimum orders on stuff because you're in a big boys game here if you're having printed packaging um, lead times minimum orders these all these things are going to be taken into account and you've got to be able to handle them at your end you can't just leave a pallet sat around the corner on the yard for um, a couple of weeks while you make a better space right yeah um, did that answer the question there yeah definitely it was really just about the the sort of I suppose nuts and bolts of making ice cream um and what it takes and yeah so did you bought a pasteurizer and also um do you say a freezer as well so yeah the freezer is a specialist piece of kit that is an ice cream freezer um we run on a, a small batch freezer um i would imagine david's on are you on a continuous freezer david yep so <clears throat> a different sort of scale to what we're at Again, it all depends on you know where, where your business, what stage your business is at. We're still very young, really, um, uh, but that's reflected in the type of you know the size of the investment. So pasteurizer, um, round figures, ten thousand pounds, and and a freezer, round figures, twenty thousand um, pounds. But if you're talking of scaling up, yeah, you'll easily treble those figures. You know. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Vicky asked how many cows you're milking, Angus. Um, we're just uh, 500 this year, yeah. But 500, and it's an all grass, once a day milking system, yeah. Great. And do how much milk? Do you know sort of roughly how much milk goes into the ice cream? Are you still selling milk elsewhere as well? Oh God! <laughs> hey, if I, if I was processing all 500 cows' milk, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, tiny, tiny, tiny amount. You know, I'm using yeah, yeah, um, well, yeah, 120 liter pasteurizer. So. Ironically, a 120 litre pasteuriser only takes 75 litres of milk in there. Cream in addition, and then your dry ingredients in addition as well. So um, by, the, by the time you've, you've put your, your, your other ingredients into your ice cream base mix, um, yeah, you, you're up there at your 100, 110 litres. Um, and you do need a bit of, um, uh, in farmer talk, a bit of freeboard around the top, yeah. Mm, so it's great, yeah, a great way to try something different with a bit of your milk, but not putting all your eggs in one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, we, you know, we're, we're on the back of a milk contract with a, with a processor who's quite happy for us to um, grow our own business, you know, uh, alongside what we're supplying to them. So, yeah. Great. Um, David, actually, it'd be great to ask you a bit about your ice cream um, first, how you got started, then the kit. Um, and then we could also ask you about cheese after that. <laughs> yeah, there's a bit, of, a bit of background noise here. Um, the, well, we started with a, a batch um, pasteurizer, um, same as Angus, uh, probably what, what was it, about 25, 40 or something liter, 20, did a 20, put 25 liters in and it gave 40 liters out. Which, uh, uh, sorry, not pasteurizer, freezer. And it was all pasteurized where uh, we have to pasteurize our ice cream. Um, and the, the cleaning chemicals, just on that question, we, we well, in the parlor, we use iodine pre and post um, milking and parasitic acid for uh, the acid. And then there's a, um, a, 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 an alkaline uh, part of the wash as well. So we, we don't use the parahexidine or whatever, the other two chemicals that were mentioned there, um, just, the, just the way it happens. Um, uh, so the ice cream, yeah. Uh, batch batch freezer, but we, we once you get up to a better scale, you, you know you, you have to get onto the um, fully automatic ice cream freezing machine, and, um, and I think it's about six hundred liters per hour, 
uh, it's not huge, but it's uh, big enough for us. And, uh, and then, of course, you go from there into um, automatic um, filling machines as well and automatic <laughs> um, uh, ingredients, um, additional machines. So we're putting in the bits and pieces uh, through a, um, a, a, a worm feed system. Uh, so it, it, it all adds up to a bit of money. Um, what was the pasteurizer? It was about 60,000. Freezer. Freezer, sorry. Freezer was 60,000. The we, we still use the same original uh, batch pasteurizer that we started with, 600 litre. Um, then yeah, I think the, the filling machine was, it was up in the... 30 about 35,000. So, you know, it, as soon as you put a bit of stainless steel onto these things, it becomes a silly, silly money. Um, and you then you have to really start um, getting throughput to, to justify the, the capital expense. But um, <clears throat> so it's, it's, a, it's always a case of taking it one step at a time, if possible, and building up. And, uh, and then when you get to the point where it's becoming unbearable, you, you have to mechanize. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, it'd be good also to hear about then, yeah, a bit more how you got into cheese and your cheese making process and the equipment that you got for that. Well, as I, <laughs> it happens, I have someone who's who was directly involved in the the the, the, the um, purchasing and securing of the the ice, the cheese equipment. I think the cheese equipment is very interesting. And you know a lot more about Wilma's here, so she's just she'll she, she'll take over. I was just standing in uh, because I can do the farming side, but the processing side is more Wilma's um, department. So I'll pass you over. Thank you, thank you right. so much, David. Hello, Wilma. Thank you Hello. so much for joining us. <laughs> just back, right? Um, the cheese side. We started. To, well, we decided that we we're going to go into cheese making probably about ten years ago, but. Um, we did it very slowly and very small scale. So we already had the ice cream factory. Um, so that was all food safe, etc. We had a lot of the basic equipment, but we still didn't have cheese vats and such like the press. Um, so for about five years, we were making cheese in a very small scale. We were making ice cream Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and making cheese Friday, Saturday. Um, and then having the big changeover on the Sunday to get back to ice cream making. And there were some times when if you had a really hot summer, we weren't making cheese at all because we were just going full pelt on ice cream. But it just gave us enough. Um, and all of that, everything, I think I can say confidently, everything we've bought has been second hand and sometimes very second hand. Um, so we bought quite small scale um, cheese making equipment because we didn't have a big... Um, area, you know, the, the, the footprint of, the, of cheese making equipment is large, but it isn't necessarily large in ice cream, so we didn't have much space to put it. Um, but it, it made us realise that we really did want to go into cheese and uh, not um, continue on a, such a big scale with ice cream making. We wanted, well, it wasn't that big a scale, but we wanted to scale one back and, and get something that we felt was more sustainable than ice cream. So um, we decided that yes, we were going to convert yet another barn on the farm and have dedicated cheese making facilities. And that project took three years to do. Um, and we bought, we, we only, we had a, a 400 litre vat and we changed that. We added to that and got a 1400 litre vat. We've got a much bigger cheese press. Um, I heard someone mentioning a dishwasher earlier Earlier on. We got a fantastic dishwasher, which was just such a relief because when you move that to that just a little bit bigger scale, um, washing all those moulds can be a real pain. Um, and we did buy a pasteuriser. We already had a pasteuriser for ice cream making, but by this point we were in a completely different building in a different part of the farm. And we went through a long debate about whether we should buy a pasteurizer or not. But we had applied for a grant um, uh, from the Scottish government. And one of the off the record conditions, they said we would have much more likelihood of success if we had a pasteurizer, because you will, many of you in the cheese making business will remember 
the uh, horrible situation that um, the Errington's Cheese found themselves in about, probably that would be about five, six years ago now, can't quite remember. So the Scottish government have actually wanted to see the end of raw milk cheese making in Scotland. So we bought one for tokenism uh, and to get a grant. Um, and we, we now make eight different cheeses and six are raw and two are pasteurized. Um, so that probably wasn't answering any of your questions other than what equipment we've got, but that's the kind of the background of how it came about. No, that was absolutely brilliant, thank you. Um, it'd be great to know, yeah, about the difference between making raw milk cheese and pasteurized cheese, actually seeing as you're making both. Um, well, we, we've chosen our blue cheeses to be pasteurized. Um, and no, we've, we've got two, sorry, we've got two blue cheeses that are pasteurized. We've got one that is unpasteurized and it's the softer blue that we've pasteurized. I think um, it certainly seemed to be that, that a soft cheese, I mean, pregnant women, old people, et cetera, et cetera, are advised by the NHS not to, to eat soft cheese nor blue cheese, whether they're pasteurized or not. Um, and, and, but they certainly prefer them to be pasteurized. And we were in that stage of just getting into the game, just getting approval from EHO, coming back with some sometimes three page audits from them as to everything that was wrong and what didn't meet their criteria. So we really felt we had to use that pasteuriser and not have it sitting in the corner. Um, our cheese makers, they, they can feel and smell and taste the difference between a pasteurised and an unpasteurised cheese. Uh, the first time we, we tried to make an unpasteurised cheese um, because environmental health had been so adamant that we should be pasteurised pasteurizing everything. The first time we tried to make an unpasteurized cheese, there was just joy in the cheese room. They were just so happy with the differences and we nurtured that cheese so well and got it through the system and just the difference was quite incredible. Most of our customers, um, that's not true, not maybe not most, but a significant number of our customers want raw milk cheese. That's what they want. That's why they're coming to us. Um, and they accept that a couple of our cheeses are pasteurised, but they, they are coming to us because it's raw. It's the health benefits um, perceived or otherwise, as some people would argue. Mm. And you mentioned that you work with uh, cheesemakers. So did you, when you got started, kind of um, find local cheesemakers who could share kind of uh, recipes or, you know, cheeses to start with? Like, how did you choose the first cheese that you made? <laughs> well, um, I think it was 2012, I went on a cheesemaking course and I realised I didn't have that skill. I, um, I, I, don't, I don't have the craft. I can take temperatures and take pHs and things like that, but to actually smell a cheese and know that it's there or to... To, to break a cheese and say, now it's ready. I didn't have that. Um, and we had someone on the farm whose husband worked for David and uh, she was really, really interested in it. And she says, oh, I'd love to give it a go. So she learned from scratch and she went on the same cheese making course as I went on and came away with so much more. And she and the person that had been our mentor, um, they, they kind of decided what cheeses we would make. And um, that got us off to the, our first four cheeses. And uh, unfortunately, she became really ill and had to leave. And we were in this position of uh, needing to find, realizing how helpless we were, or I was, and having to find a cheesemaker. And that took about a year. Um, um, but, but we've now got someone who's been with us now for about three, four years. And we've got two local people that have joined and they're being trained to be cheesemakers. And really, I, having been in that situation where we'd about a year without uh, an ex, not experience, but someone not actually not knowing what they were doing, i.e. me, um, I didn't want to go through that again. So we're, it's, it's getting the insurance policy behind you that maybe your main cheeser might leave because they do. Um, and but But we would have two people who were local who would hopefully be able to 
to uh, you know, follow through. Great, thanks. Um, if we just jump to Johnny, it would be great to hear how you got into making cheese. Did you go on a cheese making course um, or did you find someone to make it for you and yeah, how you've scaled that up and what, what kit you got? <laughs> Um, so originally we went on a, like I said earlier, on a, on a journey of cheese. So we went and visited cheese makers around the UK and started to understand, we, we, we picked cheese makers who sit like they were similar to us in a, they had a herd of cows of, you know, a similar size and, um, they made cheese on the farm. Um, because if they could do it, there was no reason we couldn't do, we couldn't too. So after doing that, we then we then found like there was a, um, a common sort of wholesaler these these good cheeses were selling to, and that was Neil's Yard Dairy in London. So we got in contact with Neil's Yard Dairy and, uh, and said, can we come down and visit you? We're interested in making a raw milk cheese, um, of which they were very um, happy and very interested in us. And, um, and so we visited them and, um, and it was that point where it was obvious where they, what cheese we were going to make um, because all of the cheeses on their counters were from the British Isles except for one which was from France and that was the the breeder mo so um, we asked why you know why didn't you use a, a British raw milk brie and they said well we can't get a hold of one there isn't any so it just seemed the obvious thing to do so from that point on which is like the next question is how do I make a breeder mo style cheese which is as good as breeder mo and um, the obvious thing is to try and find a cheesemaker from France who understands how to make Brie de Meaux, um, of which we did. We, we found a cheese consultant who, who was a cheesemaker um, and he, was, he specialised in soft cheeses um, and knew the recipe how to make um, Brie. And uh, so we got in touch with the, uh, this guy called Ivan and, um, and he agreed to make uh, help us design our cheese making building uh, and but one of the things I, I said to him is like it's really important that we 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 need to be as good as the Brie de Meaux cheese um, and he said well if you're going to do that he said everything has to be right um, and um, the first thing what he said was what was your breed of cows and I said it's a Holstein a herd of Holsteins and he said uh, it's not going to work that was his words um and uh and i said why is that he said well you're well certainly he looked at our fats and proteins of our milk and and it wasn't the right fats and proteins for making cheese and so the next you know i was really committed to doing this um and i was prepared to change our cows our cows to 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 make the best cheese so we we went to france and bought a small herd of montbelliard cows and um, and uh, and swap some of our Holsteins. We didn't send the Holsteins to France and did a swap. They didn't want them. Um, but um, but we sold some Holsteins, funded the Montbelliards, and um, started milking them. Uh, along uh, in that period of time, in 2012, we uh, renovated our old barn, the one I'm standing in, uh, sitting in now. It's the cheese making is below this building, um, and um, and we turned that into cheese making facilities right next to the milking parlor. Um, and um, and we, we 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 began making cheese in 2013. Um, all of the equipment uh, we we bought from France with the help of our cheesemaker friend, um, and um, and yeah, it it really has been um, you know from 2013 till now has been a, 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 a you know understanding how to make good cheese um, and. Um, yeah, it's it, it's yeah, got us to the point where we are now, where we've we've moved out of that building and into a bigger building, and we're actually now um, building another building. Um, so um, it's just uh, just keeps leading from one thing to the next. Um, cheese sales are really strong, and um, I, the, the, I certainly think the sort of COVID has made the, the the cheese industry in the UK or the artisan cheese industry in the UK stronger. And um, there's more demand than ever. It's what I'm seeing. Have we lost Annie? 
I did disappear, I think, for a second. I hope you can hear me now. It just told me my internet connection was unstable, but I've got my yeah. fingers crossed. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and thank you for that. I think I only missed a little bit <laughs> while I was trying to figure it out. Um, I just had a thought, actually, to ask Wilma quickly before we move on from cheese, um, what your uh, sort of building is like that you make your cheese in and how you started. So whether you kind of had a purpose-built setup or... Um, well, I'll, I'll try it and be really brief, but I'll probably get emotional with this one. Um, I got an email from someone, and I'm going back about five years, um, and he said, hello, I'm from Spain. Um, I design cheese dairies. No, he didn't. Sorry, forgot about all of that. He says, I want to come and work for you for a month. I want to improve my English. And he went on and on and on. And it ended up with, I design cheese dairies. And I thought, I almost deleted this email because <laughs> it was just going to be another student coming for a month. Um, anyway, he came for a month and he, he was a real deal. He was uh, part of um, the was it Erasmus programme, the European one. He came over. Uh, he was mid-30s and had worked with all, a lot of small scale cheese dairies, uh, uh, cheese dairies in Spain, uh, mainly goat's milk. Um, so... We took him around the farm to say, look, this is where we're thinking of. In fact, we were actually seriously thinking of making cheese in about six containers put together because we'd seen that done. And we thought, well, that'll be cheap. Um, and he told us that if we did that, we, we, he would go back to Spain. Um, he wasn't going to hang around and be part of that kind of project. And he walked around the farm and he saw an old uh, dilapidated building that we were ashamed of and we stored all the junk in. Um, and he saw a beautiful stone building that could be renovated and be the perfect, kept at the perfect te temperature for cheese making. So um, he managed to convince us that this, we were going to renovate this building and he sat in our kitchen for the, the next three weeks and had his AutoCAD and he designed the building. Um, and it brought in three different part it was three different buildings which had all been different things through their lives but it just looks beautiful from the outside there will be a photograph here that I could put up but let's not waste time with that um, and it works really well uh, it it has the flow of it is very good um, and we're really pleased with it there is one complication and that is which I will be honest with um, he came to us in the winter and our walls are about three feet thick and he said this will just be like a cave you'll be able to store your cheese in here We've got a beautiful room for our aging of a cheese um, and you just store it here you won't need any refrigeration you won't need uh, anything it'll just and we were very much going along the low energy route as well you know we were wanting not just to change the, our product for the sake of changing our product we were wanting to create a low energy product so we thought, oh we don't need any electricity here that's ex excellent and the farm used to make cheese um from about 1860 through to 1970 so there would be a significant part of that where they didn't have any electricity and were making cheddar um but we find that we ha usually have about three months of the year where we just can't keep the stores cool enough and we've just done uh, this summer we've done a Heath Robinson cooling system um, um, and installed that and that has helped a bit uh, but that's been the only thing that has troubled us and just not been right but it's a pretty important thing um, but yeah. it was designed by somebody for nothing we did still have to do the proper ones and a, you know, take it to an architect in this in this country so that it complied with all of the UK's regulations and not just the EU ones. Mm. No, I think that's really interesting. Actually, one last point with Johnny, actually, because I know um, in terms of energy, you have an interesting setup as well. Because when I came to your farm, you showed us, um, and maybe we'll if you quickly say a bit about that before we move on from cheese. <laughs> We're talking about the underfloor heating in reverse. reverse um, yeah, and your and your solar panels as oh, well. Right. The, yeah. So, uh, well, <laughs> just well, energy in general. Okay, energy. So, one of the things we did a couple of years ago was we 
we noticed the, um, the, the yard round the back where the water pipe was very shallow below the ground that the, um, the fat bullocks, they had um, very warm water for drinking. And it was always warm. Um, and uh, we thought, well, we are short of, um, of, 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 of energy or electricity on the farm. And it's how, what ways can we um, try to use less electricity by um, using other sources of um, something else to heat water? Uh, so we're not relying on electricity to do it. And uh, what we did was we, we were going to concrete the floor of a cow shed anyway. Um, it was going to happen. That was planned. But we decided to run a mile of water pipe um, just below the concrete. And um, and the reason a mile or there around thereabouts was it was it held the same amount of water, which our, our tank, which the water for washing the milking parlor held um, the hot water. So so we put this pipe in and um, we already knew the ground temperature was about 45 degrees um, the, when muck had been in there for a few weeks. Um, and uh, we put this pipe in and, and lo and behold, it did exactly what we expected. It delivered about 45 degrees of water. Um, and we then send that water over to the, the, the dairy. Um, it goes into a tank which then circulates round through the, um, the, the chiller compressors. So the, the compressors which make the ice to chill our milk, um, there's heat what comes off that refrigerant gas, which is wasted heat, um, and you're just trying to throw it out into the atmosphere to get rid of it. Whereas what we're doing is we're putting that water through um, uh, heat exchange with this refrigerant gas. So we actually get water from, um, you know, which would have normally had to be heated from say like 10 degrees we got that up to 70 odd degrees through free energy really um and then coupled with that we've just put a 150 kilowatt system um on the cow sheds um and um of solar panels and um the energy we don't require it puts um into batteries and the batteries store that electricity till later on in the day when the sun and um, that that um, then the batteries then kick in and then you get the the electricity which would have gone back to the grid and you'd pretty much got hardly anything for it um, is now being used um, in the evening time um, so yeah it's 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 quite fun actually playing around with um, uh, sources of energy on the farm yeah, it's really cool. I was really impressed when I saw all of that because <laughs> I know it's quite an energy. It can be, I suppose, an energy intensive process running a lot of this equipment and particularly as you scale up. So I thought it's really clever. Yeah, you expect your electricity bills to to rise significantly <laughs> once you once you start having dishwashers and uh, three phase motors and uh, chiller rooms. Yeah, things just go up and up. Yeah, Angus, you wanted to. Yeah, two two things. I was going to come straight in. Going Wilma there on design in a dairy. Um, and I would say this for any food production area, get your drains right first. Don't have a don't have a flat floor. Always have a slope. And um, yeah, central drain, not a not a drain all in the corner of a room, you know. Um, you know, this it's it's you can't really overstress it. So yeah. uh, yeah drains and safe floors um that's on, on the practical and i noticed there as well someone's asked about ask, applying for planning permission um to be perfectly honest I, I don't think that would be very practical to apply for planning permission just just crack on and do it but make sure you do it right it's more important to get um eho on board than the planning authorities uh, um especially if it's you know, I don't know the circumstances, but if it, if it's within the same agricultural business, um, Johnny might know. You know, jumping in on this, if it's within the same business, I would imagine there's not a huge amount required of planning, is there, Johnny? What's that? Um, to apply for planning permission to uh, to make a a storage room or. I I think you've got to with agricultural buildings, you've got to have a change of use. So we've had to apply planning permission for right. that. Um, it depends on what, what sort of scale. I mean, if it's just a small room, I, I probably wouldn't bother, but, um, 
you know, if you're building a factory, then you, you know, you, you're going to get in trouble with insurance and, and, um, and things when the factory's on fire and people are in it. That's, that's when it could go wrong on you. Yeah. Uh, they've asked the question here again about landlords as well. Yeah, we're tenants. So we try to involve the landlord pretty well with everything we're doing going forward. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, your landlord's better. So uh, again, it all depends on scale, you know, obviously if you're building a factory, um, yeah, you're going to have to, <laughs> you're going to have to put your head on the line there. Yeah. I think probably I'd just say on that oh, note. Yeah, please do. <laughs> sorry, it's um, what we've done because we've used um, agricultural buildings, obviously for the cows, we've just put the cows straight in and they're all internal changes for processing and bottling. We haven't actually, strictly speaking, applied for planning permission for those. Um, but obviously for the cafe and things that we did. So I think it depends on, on scale very much as everyone else has said. Um, and if you've got to put something new up, then obviously you'll, you'll need permission anyway. Um, but it's, it's, it's slightly different and they'll slightly sort of look through it um, or ignore it, the plan as well, if you're producing for yourself and you're selling for yourself. If you start selling off site or if you start bringing stuff in, then it, it's very different, so. Yeah, that's a good point. Actually, well, the, the next thing I wanted to talk about was um, butter and cream and yogurt, actually. So I maybe we'll ask you a bit, Rebecca, first and then jump to Angus afterwards um, about how, because I know that you got started with making butter for a restaurant, is that right? Or a chef, local chef? Um, and yeah, how, how you got started with butter and, and the process that you um, started making it with and, and I suppose if you've changed or adapted it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, uh, when I used to have more time and before COVID, used to go up to um, a local Michelin star restaurant for um, cookery demos and just chatting to the chef there. He, as soon as we said we got cows, he was really excited about the cream. And then we went up there for one night for dinner and he came and did always speak to everyone at the end of the meal. And he put his hands on the table and said, right, when are you going to make me butter? I went, uh, I guess we'll go and buy a butter machine then. So um, that was that, that was nearly, God, that was four years ago. So we've been supplying them ever since. Um, so, through our various different contacts, um, we bought the best cream separator that we could just about afford, which was second hand. Um, we now have two second or two and a half second hand cream separators, and we're sort of holding them together with um, a little bit of luck, love and luck. Uh, we need to go up to the next size, really, but you know, finances are a little bit squeaky, so we haven't. Um, same thing with, with the butter maker, um, although we did actually buy that new, um, it's an Ella creme, it's French, like all things dairy seem to be French, although there's a lot of um, Eastern European ones on the market, you tend to get what you pay for. Um, so it's it's all about having someone who's going to sell it to you and then look after you if something goes wrong. Um, so it was, yeah, the local chef got us into making butter. Um, the first time we made butter was a complete disaster um, because we didn't you know, you spend three grand on a butter maker, it comes with half a page of English instructions and the rest is all in many, many other different languages. And the, the key thing is, is temperature. And we were in a hurry on a Sunday morning, wanted to make butter, um, so we fluffed it, but we made the most indestructible whipped cream. Um, it was amazing. It took a very long time to, um, to go through. I think we had about 15 liters of, of very, very thick whipped cream, um, but we got it right the second time. Um, so we have changed the recipe a bit. We didn't use to culture the cream, but because again, starting from scratch, not very many cows, not that much milk, not enough cream. Um, we didn't culture it to start with. Um, culturing is fantastic. You're lowering the pH, which is making it a more inhospitable um, climate for stuff to, undesirable stuff to grow in. So it extends your shelf life. Um, we do a lot of shelf life testing for everything. Um, but the shelf life on our butter now with the culturing is about six weeks, whereas we were putting two weeks on um, the, the uncultured butter. Um, interestingly, though, we have very different customers for both types of butter. Some customers um, will never, ever want a cultured butter. Um, some don't care. Some will only ever want a cultured butter. Um, it just depends on the person. So we try and stock everything. Um, we do sell butter frozen. Um, we genetically test the cows to see which ones are A2, A2. 
um, that's a big emerging market with people's um, lactose intolerances and things. It's a different protein, so it's a lot more easy to digest. Um, so we do, we sort of save that up um, and we, we make the butter and sell it frozen. Um, cream is another obvious one. I mean, Jersey cows, lots of cream. We have in the summer, probably the best, best conversion rate for us is about 15 or 16% of the milk goes to cream. Um, and then we're about 65% at the best time of year for um, cream to butter ratio, uh, which is which is pretty good. Uh, we do sell some skimmed and semi, which helps as well. Um, anything spare we feed to the pigs, um, but we're also making a skimmed milk yogurt as well, which is, is seems to be quite popular. So we get, get uh, quite a lot of skim milk going through that as well. Um, probably if we had time and I could do with another walk-in chiller room, um, we'd that might be the one thing that we would wholesale um, demand sort of through the roof for it but we'd need another dedicated walk-in chiller um, somewhere with really good drainage um, the drainage in our processing room is is adequate um, but you don't want the big spillage in there otherwise you spend a lot of time chasing water around the room with a squeegee to a central drain but um, still not as good as it should be um, so yeah that's how we got into to butter and cream um, it's yeah it's, it's again listening to the customers they seem to sort of like telling us what they want and we try and do it um which gets a really good response and almost guarantees that you've sold something before you've made it which is quite nice and so did you yourself try all the processes so you you make the um yogurt yourself um and yeah yeah like what usually happens is i think of something crazy to make um and then i start making it and then I get busy and have to go off and do something else. So to, we'd be also quite good because we're continually training everyone up in the business to be able to make everything. That way, if someone goes off sick or if someone moves on, you know, you're not um, at that awkward period in time where actually no one can make something. Um, mm. And Stuart and I accept that we are probably the biggest risks to our business. Um, Johnny and I had a conversation about this a long time ago. And actually, thank you, Johnny, because it did resonate. Um, and we suddenly thought, oh my God, actually, if something happened to us, we'd be completely screwed. So we do try not to have any specialists within the team. Everyone has to know how to do everything. Um, and if they're not interested, then they don't stay. Does that mean that everyone's been through the HACCP? Um, is it like a training or a course as well? So everyone has that? Yeah, so they all know the paperwork, they've all had the training um, and they're expected to, to stick to it very thoroughly. Um, I have a um, I have a good sense of humour most of the time, but not when it comes to, to hygiene. It's either good enough or it's not. And if it's not good enough, no one no one's allowed to stay. Yeah, that's fair enough. <laughs> um, thanks, Angus. It'd be great to chat to you a bit about how you started making butter um, and your process for it. Um, process for it. One of the things that we actually do different with our ice cream, going back a step here is we actually use our own cream a lot of on-farm ice cream processors will purely because of the simplicity of doing it is is pick up the phone and order cream in from dairy down the road we chose to separate our own milk um, to get the cream to use in our ice cream um, and i was finding and end of the week you know you, you've got x amount of liters left over uh, possibly let's have a go at making butter and um, yeah a bit like Rebecca just said you know wacky ideas yeah we'll have a go at it and uh, yeah you know um, that's how it came about basically a churn a week 45 litres 50 litres into the butter and um, again borrowed somebody's butter churn uh, to make the butter uh, and now dare I say yeah I don't really start advertising the butter the butter we could shift any amount of butter without a doubt it's, but then it's finding a home for the skim afterwards so which which obviously impacts on your your costs of production and just the sheer logistics on it yeah um so when did you have you bought a butter churn now so yeah um, the um at the moment um no i'm still borrowing a butter churn at the moment but that's that's working all right uh, similarly i'm not actually separating the cream on site i'm actually taking our milk off site to a local dairy separating separating the milk there and bringing the cream home so uh that, that that's that's coming fine that 
Um, one thing Rebecca touched on there was cold walk-in cold room storage. Um, if anyone's thinking of doing any processing of any sort, uh, a walk-in a, a walk-in cold room is 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 just another asset that's just so useful. Um, you don't even have to have it switched on if you don't need it. You know, it's there as a dry store, but as a food room, as a cold store, yeah. Um, don't rely on small fridges and freezers. Yeah. Um, yeah, so coming back to that, again, um, I'm, I'm, I'm handling my cream in the churns and what have you, uh, and, it's, and it's working well, yeah. Uh, patting, everything's, everything's very manual. Um, there's, no, there's no automation in there. Um, and again, regular testing. Uh, I'm quite happy with that. Our, ours is a lightly salted butter. Um, we're not cultured. Cultured sort of on the radar um, for doing. It's something I'd like to have a go at. But it, again, I think it's a bit more of a specialist market with it. Um, but for us, it's the fact that it's 100% grass-fed butter is is what's selling the butter, and it is yellow. It is golden, golden yellow. Yeah. Great. Um, I think we might move on to talk a bit about packaging and labelling and shelf life. And I know we've touched a bit on these things before, but just to sort of hone in on that. And while we're with you, Angus, maybe if you could talk a bit about the um, packaging for your ice cream and your butter and um, why you chose it. Um, and also, I think I remember you saying when we spoke before um, that ice cream was a good product to get into because of the shelf life, because you can keep it in the freezer and it hasn't got a sort of time limit on selling it as such as other perishable dairy products yeah ice cream is actually quite a, you know quite a comforting product to go into one it's 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 fun it, it is a fun product and no two ways about it um but on a serious note you know the, the element of caution in you always says oh what happens if we don't sell it well no ice cream you can make and yes it has got a shelf life as without you know you're there with a 12 month shelf life quite comfortable whereas if you're putting a you know, a, a soft cheese on the shelf or a yogurt, you know, you're thinking, Craig, I've got four weeks to shift this, then what? And, you know, if four weeks even, some are even less, obviously. Um, but, uh, yeah, falls in between the two. Yeah, we're, we're, we're putting six weeks on our bottom now, four, five weeks on the bottom now. Um, and, and that's falling comfortably within our testing um, shelf life that we do. You know, we fall within that nicely. Um, Packaging-wise... Uh, it depends where your market's for. With the ice cream, you know, if I went back two years, um, ninety percent of our business was pub, restaurants, cafes, so catering tubs. Um, as soon as lockdown hit, the whole thing shifted completely, and we found ourselves putting them into retail packs, so uh, small, what we call theatre pots. And yeah, now ninety percent of our business shifts through small theatre pots, and um, not doing so much on the on the wholesale tubs. Um, so well, as soon as you're in pots like that, branding is is quite a key thing. But also, um, yeah, uh, trading standards information on the um, legislation, ingredients, um, shelf life, batch codes, uh, all these things. So you've you've really got to take advice as you go along there with packaging. Don't get the packaging wrong because it's a blooming expensive mistake to get wrong. Um, you know, silly that, and get everything proofread. If you're doing anything, get someone else to look over it, proofread it, and proofread it again. Um, you know, I'm talking specifically here ice cream because you've got a list as long as your arm when it comes to ingredients, especially when you've got different flavors. With butter, yeah, we add salt. Yeah, no one's going to get that wrong, but um, you know. Um, so just, what what do you do you package your ice cream in is it kind of like the sort of pay it like tubs i think i've had one of your small theater pots yeah, actually. So like the, the, again the, the the cardboard tubs with a plastic lid yeah um, and we have got printed packaging so you know it, it's it's the branding is quite key to it as well you know um, and for your butter so, sorry for the butter <laughs> greaseproof paper um and simple labels front and back um, relatively simple, but uh, of course that's all hand packed. You see, so hand packed, hand wrapped. Mm. Yeah, hand wrapped. So does, is that a lengthy process or not no, too no, bad? Quicker at it, it's, you know. It's a bit like Rebecca was saying about the bottling and milk. You know, um, you, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know what started off very laborious. Johnny, I don't know how do you pack your butter. 
Um, so our butter, I mean, it's packed by hand. Um, you know, we we couldn't justify. I did actually went. I've only recently just been out <laughs> Lithuania and had a look at butter packing machines. But if you've got, you, a, got um, you haven't even got an extruder then. Um, it, yeah, yeah, we have. Sorry, we have got an extruder, but it's still wrapped by hand. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, a butter packing machine, um, one hundred and forty thousand. If you're yeah. got a bit of spare cash floating around. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, we, um, the way our butter is made is it, it's, um, we have our own cream separator. We separate the milk as it sort of is coming from the milking parlor. So it's still warm. Um, the, 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 the cream is, um, is acidified lac with lactic, um, bacteria. It sits warm overnight. The next morning, we then put it into a, uh, a chiller and we try to chill that down quickly. And over the next three days, we let that mature. And then uh, from that point onwards, we um, churn it. And from churning it, we then um, we then put it back into a chiller to get it down cold again. And then um, at that point, we then put it through an extruder. We force it through um, uh, molds to, to make shapes. And uh, in doing so, it helps remove more moisture. Um, and um, the final stages is we we wrap every every product by hand. Um, so um, you know, and our, our butters go in little wooden boxes as well um just to add more packaging um but uh, that's the that's the system we've found which seems to work um but but you know butter you can really go down the route of machines if you want to um have every, you know lots of um shiny stainless steel machines and have it all done for you but you lose the um you lose that sort of hand hand um, made approach um, you can see the butters what are made more artisan and more, you know, by people rather than machines. And uh, there is something special about that. So you mustn't, I don't think you must lose that. Mm, yeah, definitely. And I love um, how come you chose to have your little wooden, because they're round uh, boxes, I think, because I think I've, I bought some from your vending machine. And I, I'm guessing that those are, are they compostable? <laughs> yeah, they are. I, I mean, the... the it really was the cheese. It was the, the, the um, so we, we were playing with the idea of making butter and me and my wife, Dulcie, we were, we very often come up with ideas when we're driving. So we get a drive, you know, long drive. And then all of a sudden you get all these um, crazy ideas come in your head. And um, it just seemed, seemed the obvious thing because we'd already got, a, you know, two, three of our products at that point already in boxes. And, um, you know, let's make a, a butter which fits a, a cheese box. It would be a bit, uh, a bit of a talking point. Um, so, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's how it came about. I mean, it also works quite well. The, um, you can, you know, butters, you know, sometimes you try and take them out of the foil and they will go a bit messy and stuff. So, you know, having that, uh, its own little box on the counter um, mm -hmm. you know, makes it neat, neat and tidy. Yeah, it's really smart. And in terms of your labelling and shelf life and things, what do you put on your labels and what are the shelf lives of your products? Well, your shelf lives, you, you have to have your products tested and see, you know, kind of where you get to with shelf life. Um, you know, so you can use your micro results, which you get back. But equally, you have to yourself, you have to taste those products until the point where you feel actually, you know, this is going to like make my product um, the quality of my product is being lost at this point. So it wouldn't be sensible for me to put a shelf life any further in this point. So it's not just about, you know, does it start growing bad things? It's about the way it tastes as well and your decision on what shelf life you put on it. Uh, I mean, regarding, you know, wording on the box, I mean, your EHO, your trading standards would be able to, having a phone call with those those guys would be um, the best best people to contact as to what you put on the box. I would agree with Angus reading your bot or reading the words on your on your packaging um, by several people which is what we do um, it go, has to go past three people um, before we um, we approve it so nothing gets approved and gets until it gets three ticks because you still make mistake, spelling mistakes even though you read it you read it two or three times it's still there and you think how did I miss that and I've now printed like 10,000 of them so um you know you don't want yeah, to be like that <laughs> yeah uh, vicky's asking um how do you do your shelf life testing do you use combase or do you get a lab to do it uh, we get a lab to do it yeah so can, we, I, can I ask a question what's combase <laughs> it, it's um 
it, it's a, 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 a like a clever bit of um, software uh, which you can put in your your um, you know your parameters, your numbers. Oh, here we are. <laughs> Um, well, yeah, answer, um, simple yeah, answer. It, it, get it get just, a lab to do it. <laughs> yeah, it, it it understands it understands the sort of like the like we're talking pathogens mainly that you know if if you do have this temperature with this pH, it will probably equal this, and um, and that's what that's what Combase is. Well, sound, sound, listen to what you said there. I don't think EHO or, or, or um, food standards would accept something like that. They, you, you, want, they've got, they want to see lab testing, don't they? And they want to see zero coliforms, um, yeah, zero it, pathogens. What, what Combase is good for is it, it, it gives the, you know, it gives you a good start. You're saying to you, EHO, look, Combase prediction is this with this particular product, um, but to back that up, we're going to do some testing. And we're going to prove what the com base is telling us that 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 it is correct. Um, so, so yeah, it, it is useful. But but yeah, I agree. You've you've got to do your own testing. You've got to do lots of testing to begin with until you start to feel confident with that product um, that you know it's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and then you can relax a little bit on the testing. Yeah, I think Vicky's made a point there, showing an understanding, showing an understanding of what times and temperatures and pH just do to microbiology with any food that you're using. Um, is, is, you know, you, you just got to have that background knowledge in you. Yeah. 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 So, it, one thing I once, I'm sure you guys are the same, once you, <laughs> you think, well, I'm going to be a food producer as a farmer, but you also become a microbiologist yeah. um, in do, <laughs> without realising it. Um, so, uh, you know, I never thought I'd know so much about, um, E. coli's and listerias. Um, I never would have been at school and believed I would have, uh, known all <laughs> this stuff. Yeah. It's amazing, really. Yeah. I was going to come next to you, Wilma. Right. I'd love to hear, um, from you about your packaging choices and your labeling and yeah also your microbiology <laughs> oh can i briefly go, do combis it seems that in scotland environmental health are going to try and make us use combis for everything i mean we even know a farm shop with a butcher's department in it and they're going to be asked to do um, a combis test for their sirloin steak their mince their sausages their whatever even though they've been a um, you know put in three weeks or whatever on the same product forever they are going to be asked to do it all over again. Uh, so there's quite a, a kickback at the moment against you having to use combis. Anyway, back to packaging. Well, we're, we're still doing ice cream and cheese. Um, we found the whole, again, maybe it's just because where we are geographically, um, there's very poor recycling facilities and collections in this area. Um, and we find that compostable materials there's no there there's no collection there's no facility near us and there's none of the, the the companies that collect your waste that take it to any um a facility that can handle it um we also uh, like angus was talking about using the little theater pots we we sell quite a lot of them as well um but they're, they're tetra pack style so that means they look like card but they're actually coated with plastic. And there are lots of facilities around the UK that are able to separate these out um, and, and recycle them separately, um, but not where we are. And again, there's nobody collecting uh, to take them to a facility that can. So for our half litre size, we've stuck with plastic. And that's a whole communication exercise um, with the public because plastic is bad um, and even though the recycling facilities are available. Um, so we, we did change over to a compostable tub um, and then discovered that the tub itself had a six month um, shelf life, but our ice cream had an 18 month shelf life. So we were having to cut the shelf life of our ice cream because the packaging we were putting it into wasn't going to survive as long as our ice cream. So we've had all sorts of dilemmas uh, about that and in the communication of this to our customers. Um, the cheese side, um, that's a 
our customer is much, much more interested in our packaging. Um, we sell a lot by, and um, we'll maybe come to that later, but we sell a lot direct from our, our own website. This year, it's 45% of our sales are direct to the public. Um, last year, it was 65 because it just went absolutely mental through that lockdown period. Um, and just about everybody wants us to um, wrap the cheese in wax paper. But that actually only gives a shelf life on our cheese of about a week. Whereas in some of our cheeses, we can, well, we for all of our cheeses, it's between five and seven weeks. So we've, we've got to explain this difference. And yes, we can do that, but by the time you get it, and it'll, you know, we've packed it on day one, uh, we'll, it leaves us on day two, you get it on day three, and it's going to be out of date by day seven. The majority of people will then say, okay, just vac pack it. Um, I, I'm pretty sure there is now a compostable vac packing, uh, vac packing plastic. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure not I actually... Emailed, is it not? Yeah, I think I emailed, emailed them and didn't even get samples, so I kind of forgot about that for a while. Yeah. Um, so for the vast majority of our cheese, it's into a vac pack. Um, bag um, and then we label it and just like Johnny was saying um, you need to get your ingredient well I suppose it was maybe Angus on the ice cream side on the cheese side um, we've gone for a very strong logo um, we we say we've got, a, <laughs> got so many blooming logos on there so we've got the the soil association logo logo on there We've joined the Vegan Society, though to be honest, I'm not sure that it's buying as much, but at the moment we've got the Vegan Society's label on there. We haven't got PFLA on, but that's one that we should probably get on, but maybe the public needs to recognise it more before it's worth putting on. Um, and then you've got the ingredients, the nutritional information, um, and, the, and we put on the inside of our label, we put our story. Um, so we're kind of happy with the label that we use on our packaging. We're just not happy about having to stick everything into back bag bags. Um, did you ask shelf life or anything? I think, did I cover that? Um, yeah, we talked briefly about um, shelf life. Actually, one thing that just came to me, I wondered, um, do you say if your products can be frozen or not? And do you-, do you We don't say it on the pack, but if anyone emails, we do so informally. And, and, and I mean, it'll be fine, but uh, it does change texture. Um, so it's not going to grow um, anymore or <laughs> grow bacteria, but it is going to change texture. So we say that to them and, and we find that people will buy three times 500 gram blocks of cheese and not just one and freeze a couple uh, when, yeah, so we do. Yeah. Um I think a note on the compostable packaging as well. From what I've heard on the meat side, it can make the meat look quite yellow. I think I don't know, it's the colour of the um, compostable uh, backpack is is not great for how the product actually looks on the shelf. Um, I'm not quite sure. I don't know what your experience with it is, Rebecca. Um, so packaging, because we do so many different things in so many different ways, um, I spend a lot of time thinking about um, so our milk um, is available in glass and plastic. Um, one thing we're always talking to people about, and it's constantly, I hate the word educate, um, but is it about having that conversation and trying to educate the consumer as to, you know, the fact that actually plastic is not evil if it is recycled properly. Um, glass is brilliant if it is used enough times, otherwise there's a tipping point at which it is utterly pointless. Um, with our other products, um, we try and use compostable packaging. Our butter is in compostable packaging and that doesn't have any effect um, on shelf life. Um, and that is quite popular. It's quite, you know, people enjoy being able to tell their friends that little story. Um, the cheese wise, obviously we run a full deli counter. We have experimented with the compostable backpack, but it's a case of, can it be composted at home, which our butter wraps can, or has it got to be a, a proper composting facility? And once you get past those hurdles, if, if it's a, it has to be a proper composting facility, is there one locally? Um, and there isn't in most places. And probably what you'll find is most people won't compost it anyway, or put it out that, you know, hopefully they'll put it in recycling. Um, 
So one thing we found with the meat is you can get some really snazzy looking um, bags, which are theoretically compostable from some of the um, big suppliers like Dickens. Um, but these things, they say recyclable or compostable and they can't be done in this country. Um, theoretically, they need to be shipped back to Spain or wherever. And of course they don't, they end up in landfill. So um, that's a, a huge hurdle that we've, we've got to go through in this country. Um, so we buy a lot of cheeses um, at the minute that are packed by um, the people that sell them to us. Um, at Christmas, what we tend to do is buy bigger cheeses in and then we're cutting them on the block and then we can put them in wax paper um, and just remind people they need to let them breathe or use them within a really short period of time, uh, which is fine most of the time. Um, but yeah, no, packaging is a complete nightmare. Um, but uh, is what it is, we, we can't sell the stuff without it. Um, we, we're gonna rebrand our ice cream, um, which is interesting listening to Angus um, and, and David and Wilma talk about um, ice cream ingredients. And um, we've been working for a long time to make our ice cream ingredients more simple. And we have now nailed the recipe. So it's it's homemade cream cheese, homemade cream, well, our cream and our milk, um, plus some corn flour. Um, that's gonna make our label a lot more attractive. Um, bearing in mind our customers with raw, um, they're not wanting ice cream with millions of ingredients. Um, we don't get the volume when we make it. Um, if you're adding lots of dry ingredients, you get more volume. Um, um, but it, it seems to be working so far, fingers crossed. Hmm. Well, that's really interesting. Um, I think, well, we've got 20 minutes left, so we'll probably move on to sales and distribution. Um, and actually, while we're with you, Rebecca, it'd be great to hear about whether you focus on a sort of local or national market um, and you're kind of split between um, selling, you know, in the shop versus actually couriering stuff out and the logistics of that. Mm -hmm. So we sell um, at one farmer's market every week. Um, we used to do two, um, but we've tried to concentrate on one. So we run um, the deli counter, we do the, the milk and we do beef as well. Um, so one farmer's market a week, obviously in the shop, lots of local customers, which I think is where we would sell about 65% of our liquid milk and all the other products. And then we do online as well. Um, in an ideal world, I would prefer that everyone around the country could buy the milk that they want from their local farmer. Um, but until that point in time, I accept that we have a national market. Um, and it's, it's a nice national market. It's, it's a little bit like going to a farmer's market four times a week without having to physically pack the stuff up and go. Um, our online sales have been growing steadily. And I was laughing, Angus, when you said about not actually promoting the butter too much um, because you wouldn't be able to keep up. I'm very careful not to push ourselves too hard because I think probably sending about, probably nowhere near as many parcels out as Johnny, but, um, we're, we're doing plenty and it takes a lot of time and again a lot of packaging and then you've got the ice pack thing to get don't, get them. don't any of you out there don't underestimate the work involved with sending stuff out by courier it sounds so simple <laughs> but johnny knows exactly what rebecca's saying here and i'm agreeing with it because um you know it's it's it is a big commitment yeah i think if we were to scale up much more i would need someone um, at least part time, three hours, four hours a day, um, mm. and I'm probably saying part time being, you know, my role's probably about eighty hours a week. Um, <laughs> perhaps and, it's and, more like a full time thing, person. The other thing with mail or, or say mail or distributing stuff like that is you've got orders coming in from all over the place. It could be the phone, it could be the email, it could be a text, it could be a WhatsApp, it could be Messenger, it could be Facebook, it could be Twitter. You've got to pick them all. Up. And then you've got to pass them all up and send them out, you know. Um, God, if only everyone just walked through the farm gate and bought off the farm, please. <laughs> <laughs> that, no, that would be amazing. I mean, we yeah. um, when we first started, um, we had a website, but I didn't have any um, automated online selling. And uh, people used to get quite cross with me. And I know it damaged the amount that we could sell. But I just said, well, look, I'm not, you know, if you want something, ring me or email me, place an order, do me a bank transfer, and then I'll send it. And that was about trying to manage um, what we were promising to people. Um, now we do have a Shopify website. Um, and we definitely sell a lot more. I'm still trying to not to push it too hard. Um, but it's just trying to manage that milk flow. Um, one thing that we did start doing in lockdown was um, deliveries. Obviously, people were scared to go out. Um, I mean, the online went through the roof during lockdown. It was horrific. 
um, it's calmed down a bit now, but we started doing a an, an delivery round twice a week um, through the local, a uh, couple of local towns, and that works really well. I think the Norwich one adds up to about 40 grand a year, which we do whilst on the school run. That's so, great. There's, there's, there's lots of little ways to pick up extra income when you're starting out and if you can offer a little delivery route that's quite good. So initially you had people coming to the farm to the shed um, yeah. and get milk out of the fridge um, but then sort of scaling up you've gone into the delivery round and also sending a few things out by courier mm -hmm. and are using um, sort of a, like what kind of ice packs and is it wool cool packaging or something similar? Yeah so it's wool cool packaging and then we're sending um, out using water-based um, ice packs. You can use something called sorbet freeze, which is amazing. It's slightly better than the the um, ice packs you fill up and then freeze, um, but it's it all going straight into landfill. So there's that whole issue again of, of waste, uh, which we're always trying to avoid. Um, but no, I mean, ideally, everyone would come to the shop all the time. Um, but I think the more the more local farmers we can get doing milk and dairy products direct to their local communities, then we can cut down some of this postal. But in the meantime, it helps a lot. And in terms of sending milk out on overnight delivery, does it normally get there without too many issues? I would have said until this year, I would have said probably a 98% success rate. Um, probably at the minute it's running at about 90. Um, so we so sort of trying not to send anything now on a Monday. People tend to do a lot of online shopping at the weekend. The couriers are snowed. So Mondays are worse actually than sending on a Friday. Um, so it's mostly concentrated um, so sending out on a Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday and if I send anything on a Friday or a Monday I tell people it's at their own risk and I won't replace it if it goes missing because perishable, perishable goods are not um, insurable particularly yeah. yeah yeah no I understand that um, Angus are you do you mainly have people just coming to the honesty shop or are you sending anything out um, we're sending a small amount yeah probably yeah, eight to ten packages a week, um, I would say. But, uh, you know, some of them are to a, um, if I'm sending butter out, they're going to another whole set, you know, a, another trade customer, aren't right, very often. Um, take your point about, I hadn't really thought about the Monday actually being busy for sending stuff out on and people doing lots of shopping at the weekend. But, yeah, yeah. Um, definitely i won't send anything out after a, i don't like sending stuff out after a wednesday or a thursday um, because of the weekend but yeah have you ever done um, any local deliveries so yeah we again with ice cream we're, we're not sending ice cream out anywhere like courier you know if we're doing it if that's going anywhere that's being delivered by us so one of the things we did do relatively early on actually uh, well, was was buy a van to do our own distribution as well um, and then the van, of course, acts as you know, it's it's branded up, it's it's advertising running around locally. Everybody sees it. So, as an ice cream brand, we're a local brand, um, and uh, yeah, that that's that's something that's quite important to us. And the van going out, um, yeah, we're in charge of that because if you start if you start putting thing in a freezer, if you start putting your products in a frozen food chain. Um, it, it's it's very expensive once you you know um, it's expensive to do yourself, but if you start putting it out with third parties, it's even worse. Yeah. Okay. And with with your honesty shop, it would be great to hear a bit more about how you got that. Yeah. Well, the honesty shop just just goes from strength to strength in the sense that it, it it's not us that's driving that; it's the customers that's driving that. It's them that's using it. You know, and if if you listen to people, it's. It was quite interesting to overhear them talk about it as it's as if it's their honesty shop, you know. We're we're just there stocking it and taking the money out of it. Yeah. Um last year people genuinely did run out of money, cash, I should say. Um, so that prompted uh initially it was a bank transfer forms, which was very messy. Uh, but now we're quite happy with our um, we've got an iPad out there. For people to just do their own self-selection on um, what items they're purchasing and tap it with a card and go uh, we've got no vending machines in the honesty shop it's a fridge in there an open fridge an open freezer open shelves so yeah um, i suppose in theory someone could come in and clear out the whole lot 
not much street cred in doing that. Um, and people, like I say, people are people are genuinely honest, yeah. And it is, you know, it's t- turning over a significant amount now to the point that, um, yeah, it, it's it's certainly another animal to feed on the farm. It's certainly another animal to look after. It is a beast of its own. You you you, you can't. We can't just walk out of there at nine o'clock in the morning and say, right, we stocked up for the day. We'll be back at six tonight, and that'll be fine. Um, someone's got to be in and out of there through the day. And it stays open, you know, it's open till 10 or 11 o'clock at night. Although when we shut the doors, it's not actually locked. So, you know, we do have regulars that come for a midnight ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And some of these things actually, and it ties very much in with what my daughter's doing with regards to the, the marketing of it all, Facebook and Instagram, especially making it um, uh, very attractive to the younger a younger generation really and something that's fun the ice cream time without a doubt yeah yeah great no your instagram dalton Stary is great check that out um johnny it would be great to hear from you how you got started with the vending machines i know you've got so many now in your vending machine station but where did you start with them uh well it started with the milk um so it was um from the back of um we had some troublemakers who kept stealing the milk but I wasn't to be beaten um, and a vending machine seemed like a, a good idea so what we did at the time was there was machines where I actually dispensed the milk and you could put the whole tank in there so I didn't have to bottle it um, and this seemed like a really good move because um, your customer could bring their bottle back glass bottle and reuse that bottle and, uh, and something quite special about coming and getting your milk from the iron cow um, so um, you know that it just led from one thing to the next so just from that that first vending machine it seemed well well if we sell milk through a vending machine well we can sell anything through a vending machine so as time has gone by we've added more products and the second one was the cheese vendor because we made cheese and we then started putting our butter in there and eggs um, from an, a, 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 another local farmer and um, and then came the coffee vending machine and that's now very popular um, it, there's a lot of people come in the mornings and getting uh, coffee. It's a sort of a posh verse, version of one of those Costa Express machines. Um, and then, uh, then last year, no, year before, yeah, beginning of last year, we just before lockdown, we had an experiment selling some bread uh, at Christmas, and it really sold very quickly. And we thought, actually, let's let's go down this route, and we'll buy a bread vending machine too. So we filled a vending machine full of bread and that happens every day, fresh bread. And then recently, once we started making our yogurt, we then bought a yogurt vending machine. So um, on they go. We can't we can't make any more uh, products because there's no more room in the shed now. So we've filled it all up with with machines. Um, But I I do find I think um, what Angus said, it does sound very tempting about having an honesty um going back to the honesty system with with card not with cash uh, i think that's that's a very interesting interesting sort of point there um uh, yeah it, it i think if you do it right you can you know with good cameras around and making things easy for your customer then then i think you could mostly rely on honesty and your shrinkage you know, monitor that, what disappears, but it actually might outweigh the cost of buying machines. Um, and when you have a machine, it goes wrong, doesn't it? So um, it's, it's interesting what you say there, Johnny, about all these vending machines, uh, because if someone's purchasing bread and milk and a yogurt, have they got to do three transactions then? They do, yeah. I think it, it, it would, you would say, we, we do a market every, twice a month now, and we we tend to sell about 400 pounds worth of product more on that day when we do the market by having somebody man the shop um there's sometimes too many people there on a saturday and people come in and go again because they they're waiting to you know go into the shed um so it's an interesting one it's a it's interesting thought about going into the future you know if we did it again i'm i'm quite interested in the idea of a um, a completely, you know, like what you're doing, uh, uh, you know, no person in the shop and just relying on honesty because you can put an awful lot more things in the shop 
Yeah, well, you know, I think we've got, you know, there's, there's easy 25, 30 items there, I suppose, um, in all. Um, but different to your place, our ours, people can spend a bit of time. If they're having an ice cream, they'll spend time there, you see. So we've got picnic benches outside and a space, from, which is their space, effectively. So people are spending time there and mm. um, they're very much... Yeah, it's their leisure, I suppose, isn't it? That's what normal people do, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, it would be to be normal. Ra rather than rushing in, doing the shopping, and then rushing, you know, buying what they need and then rushing out, you know. So that that that's, I suppose, that's slightly different to how we've come at it. Because bear in mind, we started with the ice cream, and then everything else has bolted onto the back of the ice cream, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's all about the experience. <laughs> yeah. Um, Wait. Sorry, just to add, if I can, um, when we transitioned from um, an honesty shop to the what we currently are now, which is a farm shop, um, we went from the shed to the end of the building that the shop is now in with a couple of vending machines and some shelving. Then we went into a porter cabin, um, which had a couple of vending machines in, big fridge, freezer and tables full of stuff. So you can do a hell of a lot through an honesty shop. I think when we moved into the the actual building we're in now i think our i think our annual sales were were pretty good i think it's described as the best performing porter cabin in norfolk and suffolk or possibly the world i don't know <laughs> but it was a it was a real chore by the time we moved into the shop um because actually on a saturday and a sunday you'd lose us the kids lost us after three o'clock we'd go to stock up and we'd, we'd be completely beggared we'd be there all till, till we shut at eight o'clock so it was a real chore by the end. So be, be careful what you wish for. Mm. Yeah, busy. Um, yeah, we've got a few minutes left. I just wanted to pass over to Wilma <laughs> um, to ask you about your how you sell, um, if you've got a shop and if you're sending things out, if you do a local delivery. Well, we, we've had an ice cream parlour for some time and it's we've never been successful in moving that onto a farm shop type of scenario. Um, so people mainly come for an ice cream and a coffee and such like. Um, we sell our cheese through there, but we're, we're talking about quite a small market. You know, there's about 150,000 people in Dumfries and Galloway, and we're 100 miles from east to west, so that we're very sparsely populated. Um, so from the ice cream side of things, we sell about 40% locally to within Dumfries and Galloway, and we deliver that ourselves. Uh, we've got two wholesalers in England and we've got five in Scotland and uh, none of them are the big boys. They're all small scale and they service most of the rest of the of the uh, of Great Britain. Um, cheese is entirely different and it was a deliberate uh, decision that we wanted to get away from the distributors. Um, and in as much as you know, the distributors take about 40% and shops are taking between 30 and 40%. So you've got very little left yourself. Um, and on top of which ice cream's got VAT on it. So that was the, the attraction with cheese was like, let's make a product that is much lower in energy usage and also um, using just milk from the farm, but also we can get it from our um, cheese dairy to anywhere in the UK using a courier. Now, David and I have had many long discussions about how far we can push this, because he thinks we can get, you know, about 80, 90% of our sales um, via courier direct to home. And I think we're more or less at our peak at the 45 to 50 mark. I mean, we're at 45 just now, but by Christmas, we'll probably be 55. Um, and if we were to go down that, this route any further, it would mean further expansion because we don't have the physical space to pack anymore. At, at Christmas, we're putting out about 400 a day um, and we stop making cheese in that period so that we can use every available inch in the whole building to, to get all this done. And you obviously couldn't do that on a, a long-term basis. So we would need to extend on um, and then I, th I mean, right now, the whole courier thing is as stretched, if not more stretched than the hauliers. So, you know, they're no longer guaranteeing next day delivery. So there's many more uh, complaints about not getting cheese delivered the next day than we've ever had before. Um, and 
like Rebecca, uh, we don't send goods out on a Monday. We just send them out on a Tuesday and Wednesday. Because even if you send them out on a Friday, on a Thursday, they might not get there on the Friday uh, these days. So we've we've restricted to, to just leaving us on a Tuesday and Wednesday. So it can be two quite uh, busy days, um, but it still gives us um, time to. Um, we've got three people that work in the cutting and packing, and they're both three days a week, uh, and that's all they want, which is which is good. But if we were to push it any further then we'd have to get someone in full time. Um, I think I said at the moment it's about 46% of our sales are direct from us to um, the end customer. Within Dumfries and Galloway, we've got about another 20% and we are delivering them ourselves um, in a different compartment in the ice cream van. Um, and we were biggest, um, customer outside that is Able & Co. So they'll take about another 20%. So that's all pre-cut wedges as well. Uh, so we do have a, a, I call it a semi-automatic cutting machine. Uh, we do have a cutting machine that cuts wedges fairly accurately, but far, far more ac accurately than we ever do. Um, so that doesn't leave a, a lot, you know, that's 85% of our business. Um, so we've got a small scale amount going through um, a couple of wholesalers. Uh, not much. And my decision would be to grow that business, this wholesaler business, and David just thinks we can move it further. So that's ongoing debates, as I'm sure all of you have with your partners. Um, we use Woolcool, just as um, Rebecca does, um, and we find that, that, that good, and people love it. Um, we're sh still using those gel packs that Rebecca has stopped using, because we found that the pure water packs, the ice packs that are pure water, they don't seem to keep, they, they melt quicker, that basically. Um, so we've tried them a couple of times and they just, for us, they just didn't deliver at all in the summer. Um, I know somebody who um, is distributing milk around the UK and they just add in an extra um, one litre bottle of frozen water. Uh, that would be a plastic bottle of frozen water and that lasts well it was lasts a lot better obviously than the small scale um little packs so we've debated whether we add a kilo of ice to our cheese packs just to um especially in the summer in the winter we probably don't need to add anything in the summer um, into the ice packs um but keeping it chilled is is really important vast majority of people don't give a toss but legally you have to um, Great. So Thanks. Just, I was just going to say that we'll go back to sorbet freeze in the summer when it's hot. Yeah. Okay. It yeah. is the it's, it's the best stuff. Um, I've considered um, putting a liter of frozen water in, but some of our customers want to fill the box, so it's you know it's just difficult. So the sorbet freeze is a, is a necessary evil in the summer because it, it really does perform well. But the the packs at this time of year when it's cooler, they're yeah. great. Yeah. Great, thanks. Well, we're actually at two minutes past six now, so I feel we should probably bring this to a close. Um, but thank you so much to all our panellists, um, Wilma, and please say thanks to David as well for joining at the start, and Johnny, Rebecca and Angus, um, it's been great. And thanks also to Gemma for being there in the background and um, administering everything. Uh, that was really, really interesting. I feel like I've learned a lot and I have lots of things I want to add to the um, PFLA direct sales toolkit as well off the back of this um, so that's one thing to note as well that I think that there will be a sort of resources um, list or such um, that is sent out and one of them will be the toolkit so a lot of this information is in there already and yeah I've got a few things to add too. Can I just say that Annie there was one question about recommended resources on technical stuff don't yeah. be afraid from Nat, Nat Tosh, is it? Don't be afraid of asking questions. Pick up the phone and ask. You know, if it's a cheese maker, if anyone's keen on it, you know, I know Wilma will be know exactly what I'm saying here. Um, they'd love to help you out. So, number one, don't be afraid of asking. The second thing, um, there's numerous Facebook type groups out there um, which you could either lurk or join in on. You'll soon find out whether it's useful or not. But um, that and, and, and along the way, yeah, you know, have a go at it. Don't be frightened of having a go at stuff. 
and learning and experimenting as you go along. Um, yeah, and and of course, you know, if you are going to start selling EHO trading standards, food standards, or you know FSA, get them on side from the beginning because you'll learn a lot off them as well. And you know, if you don't have them on side, then you're going nowhere. So yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely case in point <laughs> when we started I, I thought the ice cream makers were so generous in their sharing and, and they are but when I'm over to cheese it, the specialist cheese association is just at a different level of how they how they operate they're just yeah. so good and the cheese makers within the organization just are so open to help each other it's it's really refreshing well, yeah. that's wonderful. <laughs> well, I'm glad. And yeah, it's nice. It's also great that you're all so keen to share your knowledge as well. So thank you very much for that. Well, we'll say thanks very much and probably um, goodbye. And yeah, hopefully we'll see you all at some point in the future. Thank you, Anna. Cheerio, everyone. Bye. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye.